in Mendham had a interesting take on the concept of agreeing to disagree because it's the view is posited that my stance is the aggressive one and his is the defensive one now okay that's not something I would necessarily agree with but I know that um, I know uh, that that's kind of a fundamental question who's the aggressor um, if you look at any particularly intractable conflict um, it's a question of who started this or who who brought this strife about look at say the alleged I'm not in the states and I can only go by what the media say which have just been proven spectacularly wrong <laughs> um, look at the alleged strife now affecting the United States um, where you know the body politic is apparently getting badly polarized or whatever um, a lot of people say that that's a bad thing, and I think that arguably it may be, but it may also be a good thing in that it's allowing people to define their own views more clearly. Now, in Mendham, I, for one, have benefited enormously from my um, interactions with you. But if you think I have the slightest notion that I'm ever going to convert you to anything, I think you misunderstand me. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm ever going to um, get you to say uncle or you win Andy or anything like that any more than you're likely to do that to me um, the whole notion I think is preposterous and it kind of goes against what I expect out of my debates with you um, I don't expect um, an agreement over this even agreeing to differ or whatever what I would put it is, maybe I've used the term agreeing to differ, but <clears throat> just to sort of delve more deeply into what I mean by that, I would sort of look at it as a big picture thing. Here we have two groups that, or two positions that are apparently irreconcilable. Um, now what do we do? Well, one can try to destroy the other or we can find some way of managing the conflict now again look at the United States and look at the two-party system that's evolved now of course the recent election a lot of Americans would say this is where the two-party system fails because basically Trump ran as a third-party candidate and demolished both parties I don't know if I agree with that because the old guard is immediately going to jump onto his bandwagon and, you know, probably turn his version of strident popular populist sort of conservatism into something resembling the old line stuff. He might be able to push things in the direction of Ronald Reagan or become even more of a Reagan than Reagan was, but that's about the best he can do. The, the system is designed to prevent the gyroscope from being knocked too far off its course. Strife. Uh, is inherent in a two-party system. It's inherent in a system that has elections because it's assumed that people are going to have competing options to choose from. But liberal and conservative in the United States will never conclusively defeat each other so long as the United States remains the United States. That's kind of the social construct or social contract part of American thinking. American Enlightenment thinking tended towards the British version, which is the... Um, the utilitarian thrust of it, which I think is what accounts for a lot of the problems that it's now um, encountering. But not all Republican tradition is, and I don't mean Republican the party, I mean Republican thinking is based upon the idea that, um, no, based on utilitarian principles. The original Republic was not so much Plato's version, it was the Res Publica of ancient Rome. That was not utilitarian. Uh, it was simply a means of preventing strife from taking over because the Romans looked at the Greeks and they said every the Greeks were incapable of ruling themselves because they believed so strongly in their own respective positions that one would destroy the other every every chance that they got and the Greeks were known for the phenomenon of stasis which is not um, our word stasis which is sort of um, utter and total equilibrium of everything kind of entropic but it was Stasis was when conflict takes over. 
So, you know, the question is war or peace, right? Well, war or peace or contained war is an interesting, there's a third uh, option there. People are seemingly um, oppositional by nature. I am. I just, somebody says something, I immediately try to refute whatever it is. Um, and I'm, but you know, people will say, oh, that's just because you're almost a professional troll. Okay, you can attack my motives all you want, but um, I've been repeating this kind of argumentation for so long that I think that, and, and I've demonstrated that it's not just something I pulled uh, randomly and I, you know, you know, if you're making videos for as long as I have, and certainly for as long as in Mendham has, and as doggedly as either of us have, you, you, I think it's not calling us trolls, or it's not as uh, tenable as you might think. Um, it's almost like conflict or the desire to clash is um, part of who we are. Um, but it's just in managing that need to clash. Um, the sort of stereotypical case of that is, say, looking at the Israeli parli parliament, the, the legislature, the Congress, it's called the Knesset, it's just one long shouting match where everybody is clashing with everybody else. People are clashing with their own uh, coalition partners or their partners inside their own party. Everybody's at daggers drawn with everybody all the time. So you sort of think, okay, well, that's not how it's supposed to work. Really? It isn't? It's almost like Parliament is the place where all fighting should take place. It's actually, that maybe is the way it's supposed to work, like in, say, the Israeli Congress. That's where you go to fight. Um, because fighting is part of who we are. Uh, Israelis just love to joke about how much they love arguing and quarreling with each other over absolutely everything in spite of what a lot of people generally think about divisions, conventional wisdom says that kind of utter divisiveness in your society is supposed to weaken you. Do you think Israel looks weak compared to its neighbors? Or disunited or anything? No, it's far more united than it looks on the surface. There's a far greater agreement on the need to contain disagreements. We need to stick together in order to basically survive. Once we've achieved that, then we can start fighting, but we must never do bring our disagreements to the point where the group itself is in danger. Um, incidentally, I get on great with Israelis because I clash with them like you wouldn't believe, but I know how to clash with them, and it's great fun, actually. And they get it. They go, wow, you're one of the few non-Israelis that we've met that can grasp what we're doing here. The Israeli shouting match is not what you might think it is. Um, that's just sort of a, an example that I'm giving, uh, you know, of kind of one of the more glaring cases of this. Um, Heraclitus, look at it this way. Where there is stri no strife, there is decay. The mixture which is not shaken decomposes. Or, Heraclitus again, one must know that war is common, justice is strife, and everything happens according to strife and necessity. In other words, nothing will happen unless there is strife. So, what do they mean by strife? Because you got to remember, Herodotus, or sorry, Heraclitus is not the way the ancients saw him is different from the way we see him now, because we only have a little bit of what he says, but we can sort of extrapolate from what other people have said about him from the ancient world, that he was basically, I would probably have to say, the real Socrates of, or the real Plato or Aristotle of the ancient world. He was revered in the same way as we now revere Plato or Aristotle. Um, they, almost everybody, sort of at least paid lip service to Heraclitus. Now, Herodotus was the great historian. A lot of what we learn about the ancient uh, Eastern Mediterranean comes from this guy, um, the father of history. Some people say he's the father of propaganda or lies or whatever, but you know, we'll leave that apart. But um, 
what this is what he says about strife. Civil strife is as much a greater is as much a greater evil than a concerted war effort as war itself is worse than peace. So, civil strife is worse than war. You ever seen a civil war, a real civil war, where groups within society all turn on each other? Now that's kind of the American Civil War is was not, if you ask me, really a civil war in the sense that it wasn't everybody against everybody. Um, look at Spain in the late 1930s. That was a civil war. Or Colombia in the 1940s. That was a civil war. It's not two factions fighting it out. It's two groups of factions fighting each other and all the factions within those two factions fighting each other at the same time. That's civil war. That's what the Greeks would have called stasis. Um, there's, you know, the fascinating version out of Thucydides of um, the civil strife in Kerkira or Kerkura, which is Corfu nowadays, where it was everybody against everybody else. Hobbesian chaos. Um, so Herodotus is saying civil strife is worse than war, which in turn is worse than peace. <coughs> So, how do we balance those two views of strife? Because almost certainly Herodotus would have known of Heraclitus and possibly would have agreed with him. Um, well, look at it this way. We know that we're going to clash and we're never going to agree with each other. Now what? Well, it looks like me and Gary should reach for our guns or something, and not metaphorically speaking. I, but I don't think we're going to do that, though. That's the absurd thing. Um, we're going to duke it out on the net. That, to me, is the mixture which is not shaken decomposes. It's almost as though I have to have somebody to argue against. That's how I work. Um, somebody that I don't agree with and will never agree with in order to sharpen my own view of myself. You may say that that's insulting, that all I'm treating you as is a foil. Okay. Well, maybe it is insulting. I never claimed to be a nice guy. Um, I don't mean it as such, but I'm just trying to be realistic about the whole situation. Um, we are so far apart that agreement or even agreement to disagree may be impossible. Okay, now what? <laughs> As I say, do we reach for our guns? Or do we sort of think, okay, what else are we going to do? Well, as I say, the whole idea of reaching for our guns is preposterous. No matter what people say about us, about me being the ultimate evil or, in, or whatever, I don't think anyone expects me to start, I don't know, bombing antinatalists or something like this. The whole idea is absurd. My whole version of shaking the mixture... Uh, consists of nothing more than talking on the internet and maybe having discussions with people in my life. Um, but strife and oppositionalism and all that kind of thing seems to be part of my nature. So there's, I would say that there's not even a, a requirement for us to agree to disagree. What I would say is what we have to do in that circumstance is to contain the disagreement to keep it within agreeable boundaries. Um, we can continue to argue forever if necessary. I have no problem with this. I love that picture of Socrates drinking his poison by, I think it was David or somebody like this, and he's still debating one of his, one of his uh, disciples, although they weren't really disciples, they were sort of hangers-on. I, I don't know what you'd call them people that pupils or whatever um, right up till the very very end he continued to debate things and continued to sort of examine ideas I'll probably be arguing with somebody till my dying breath um, I don't do that with my wife I don't do that with my child but I do that with just about everybody else I drive people nuts because of my propensity to argue with them about everything. Um, I've lost so many possible friendships that way, but I have no regrets over this. If I have to give up on what I am in order to have friends, I don't want friends. 
I mean that. Um, most people are afraid to live that way. I am not. So, you know, if you know, so be it. Um, in the meantime. I accept the idea, and I accept what you say when you say that agreeing to disagree kind of favors the status quo. Maybe it does. I don't think I represent the status quo, though. <laughs> you might say that I represent the status quo in that I'm not an antinatalist. But, well, as I said, I just I just got a vasectomy last week. Does this make me an antinatalist? Maybe it does by some accounts. I'm There's no point in criticizing me anymore. In that sense, I'm on your side. It's impossible now for me to have kids. And what, you know, I've got a kid now. That's in the past. I can't change it. You can say that you should feel guilty about it. Feel guilty about something I can't change? Pfft, I forget it. No way. Not going to happen. I can do nothing about the fact that I have a child apart from murdering him. And if you think I'm going to do that, well, yeah. <laughs> you want to start urinating into the wind, go right ahead. But that's, you know, okay. Uh, again, nobody said that our paths, the path of life affirmation and life denial is easy. Um, and again, I, I qualify that. Mystic of the Sands is perfectly right when he says my point of view could be considered life denial and your um, position could be arguably life affirmation. Um, so anyway, um, how do we manage the disagreement? Um, you're not always the most respectful person, Gary. But one of the things that I do respect about you is what I perceive as your powerful need for self-ownership. Um, and I think that the hostility is part of that. I have no problem with maintaining a hostile relationship with somebody. None. This much must be obvious. Um, as long as there are rules as to how the hostility is to be um, expressed or conducted. But if it's confined to YouTube, that's fine. Um, you, you know, in YouTube, you get angry at each other, you take a hiatus. End of story. I'm perfectly capable of taking a hiatus from YouTube. Um, other than that, or I just I don't have time to do it. It's Sunday morning now. I've got a bit more time. But you don't have to you don't have to agree with people. Or this is my position. I understand that your position is different. Um, but in a way, it's kind of right. In a way, it's not as if we really want to agree with each other here. Um, in fact, I would say that in a sense, we want to continue the conflict, strangely enough. We want to keep the mixture shaken. Um, and yet, there are boundaries. Like A lot of people say that I've abolished all axioms. And a lot of people would say that, again, don't take this the wrong way, you have abolished all boundaries of conduct, but you haven't, and I haven't either. You're doing it on YouTube, which is a boundary of conduct in and of itself. Whatever you say, whatever venom comes out of your mouth, or whatever people perceive as venom, is just stuff said into a microphone at the end of the day. That's all it is. And at the end of the day, um, you can say that I have abolished all axioms, but I live a reasonably conventional life, which relies upon axioms. I just drank a cup of coffee in the morning, and I didn't drink a cup of tar, even though axiomatically, or at least my my view of things, they are the same thing. Although, the coffee I make, I think quite a few people would consider tar, but anyway. Um, I might say that I think the laws of gravity don't necessarily exist in the way that most people think they are, but if you think I'm going to climb up to a 12-story building and step off a balcony just to sort of put that theory to the test, no, I'm not going to do that. It just depends on what, in what context you're using axioms. Um, axioms, as I say, I reject mostly in terms of truth value. But if you think I don't live by these axioms, wow, no, you misunderstand. 
Um, and on certain levels, I still do believe that all the laws of physics work, but on certain levels, I don't believe that the laws of physics all work. That's Again, that's Syatvada, right? The, the Jain theory of maybe. Um, you can say that in some ways, yes, I do believe in the laws of physics, i.e., if I have this neck massager, wonderful thing, six bucks, use that to rub the back of my neck, and that's exactly the part of your neck that gets sore when you're, on, when you're sitting down on a computer for too long and I work at a desk. Uh, but if I bop myself over the head I, with this thing, I know it's going to hurt. Uh, but if I rub the back of my neck with it, ooh, that feels nice, even though it's kind of painful if you ever had that kind of a massage. That's like This thing squeezes your muscles quite hard, but it's this weird, wonderful, sweet pain that you get. <clears throat> this is the laws of physics that I say don't really exist, right? So in certain ways, I do believe that they make sense to follow. and in, in, other, in another sense, I don't. So in a certain sense, I agree that um, that this conflict is in utterly intractable. But in, in another sense, I say that it, the, this is a properly contained conflict. Um, I'm almost frosty in my insistence on keeping YouTube and my personal life separate. I feel sometimes kind of bad about that, regardless of how how I feel about guilt. I'm a human being. I feel bad about sort of putting up that frosty front to people and that superior smile and everything. Um, but that's just my way. That's how I manage YouTube. Um, that's what I see YouTube for. I've got all these expectations that I bring to the table, just like everybody else does. And some people see YouTube as an adjunct to their social life. I don't. Um, I must be the exception to that, I think. Um, so I don't think that agreeing to differ is necessarily the right way to describe this. I think it's agreeing to clash, but within accepted boundaries of conduct. That's all. Um, it's the old um, mafia thing. Okay, if you and I are gangsters, it's generally understood that it's okay for me and you to kill each other in the line of business. You know, that scene from The Godfather where... Um, Michael is going to have Tassio killed. Tassio isn't worried about dying. He gets it. He goes, okay, this is the life I chose. This is, you know, this could happen. And really, I did conspire against Don Corleone. But Tassio wants to tell Michael something that he really wants to make clear before he's killed. He wants to go to his grave more or less with a, I don't know, his sense of honor intact. He said, Michael, I betrayed you. But you understand this. It was just business. It wasn't that I really wanted to harm you. It's just that I, the way I saw that things were going, I thought you were becoming weak when I had no idea you were becoming strong and I chose the wrong side, and that's the business we're in. You choose the wrong side, you're dead. I chose the wrong side. I won't resist when they kill, kill me, but I want to make it clear. I only chose the wrong side not because I'm stabbing a friend in the back. Because I just thought that's the way the wind was going, and I made it a miscalculation. And of course, um, Tom Hagen, Robert Duvall says, "Don't worry, Michael knows that." Interesting, eh? You're going to kill me, but I, you know, I understand that you can kill me. But what I don't want is for you to judge me harshly here. You know, um, my sense of would you call it? My boundaries of conduct say that it's important that you understand I'm not a treacherous jerk. I'm just somebody who misread the way the wind was blowing. And Michael, who knew Tassio for decades, said, yeah, I get it. But you understand we're still going to kill you, right? And Tassio was, yes, yes, I understand it. So that's you, you want to say that that's agreeing to differ. It's not, because Tassio still gets a bullet in the head and he's buried in a cornfield somewhere. Um, but, you know, that's... That's the rules that he agreed to play by in the beginning. Uh, there are boundaries of conduct even among gangsters, or at least ideally there are. Um, we know that in the real world, gangsters slaughter each other's families all the time and everything, but in the old days when you were expected to sort of be the boss of the slum or whatever, you were expected to actually look after your people and play by certain rules, and respect was very important. Um, <clears throat> so, strife needs to be managed even though it's inherently part of us and I don't agree that we need to be at peace with each other um, again I always quote Vivekananda where he says 
what we want really is we want to learn things. Um, and you learn as much from the blows in life as you do from the embraces. Oftentimes, it's the blows that bring out the inner the inner fire more powerfully than the peacemaking. I hate to say this, but um, I think that you strongly agree with that. You find, you feel you you think that you're contained by too much camaraderie and too much kumbaya stuff, and come on, people, try to love one another right now. So do I. <laughs> um, and my frostiness is, I think, the, the counterpart to your hostility. Um, or my hauteur, or whatever you want to call it. My smug superiority, which Canadians are notorious for. Um, that's an interesting observation that um, Hyde Loday made very quickly. He said, Andy, your, your giggling and your superior nature are pretty similar to other people who have you know, cer certain masks that they wear. And he was right, of course. Now, what do you do about that, though? What do you do about the fact that you want con you want contact with other humans, but you believe that hostility is essentially the best way for you to, for you to express your contact with each other, but not deadly hostility? See, I have no desire to destroy the people that I debate with. I would just like to have the debate go on forever. Um quite an admission, isn't it? You say, oh, that's just a troll speaking, or um, um, B. Quimby had an interesting, I don't know, he was trying to psychoanalyze me and say that um, that it's just my nature to demolish everybody else's point of view. And, and you know, that's what I dislike about instant pop psychology. It's just a way of saying that the other guy is bad. Um, the other person is bad. If You know, the, the, the great... Um, the great term now for a heretic these days is a narcissist. Uh, you come up with all this psychological stuff, philosophical stuff, psychiatric uh, stuff, to basically say that person is an unmutual, that person is a thought criminal. We use a different term before we burn them at the stake, and we now we only burn them at the stake metaphorically, but we still do it. We call them a narcissist. Um, that is not something that I would... That's not the kind of tactic I want to apply. I don't want to feel good about my own position by attacking somebody else or by creating somebody for the whole community to blame, even though guys like um, uh, René Girard say that that's inevitable in human society, that we all seek scapegoats because that's the only way we can keep ourselves from falling into that stasis that Herodotus, or sorry, sorry Thucydides described. We need scapegoats. We need somebody to nail to the cross in order to bring peace to the community. And having nailed this person to the cross, the person becomes holy because now they, you know, they are the representative or they are the, the the manifestation of the harmony that has come to the community by us transferring all the blame for everything to them. Um, you know, it's the old uh, the old Jewish thing. Look, they're not going to kill us all off. They need us. Why? Because they need somebody as a scapegoat in their society. So we'll always be here in one form or another, but it's always going to be a rough, rough, rough ride because that's our function in society. That's the cynical um, uh, Jewish view of the relationship. And, it, and it's a depressing view, too, when you think about it. It's um, almost like a, a defeated view of what it means to be Jewish or even means to be a human being when you come up with that attitude. But it's you know, reasonably common when you read Jewish literature. Um <clears throat> Scapegoating of that nature, I don't agree with. I agree with if, you, if in as much as it's possible, to con contain the conflict within certain agreed boundaries. Again, the U.S. or the modern political system of almost any Western liberal democracy comes to mind. Um, like in Canada, you have it's really obvious and blatant. It's the same thing as the United Kingdom. You have the government and you have the loyal opposition. It's almost like we've institutionalized conflict in our society and sort of roped it in. The, the Romans made no bones about it. That's exactly what their republic was supposed to do, was to make them strong enough to be able to defeat their exterior enemies. So, if, yes, we are going to, con to... We're violent people, would, the Romans would say. We're violent people and we're prone to war and we're prone to um, trying to rip the other guy off, take everything that he's got, and build huge monuments and dance on this guy's grave. That's just how we are. 
as Romans, not as humans, but as Romans. So we build this republic in order to manage those differences, so that we are stronger on the, you know, as a as a cohesive group, in order to do the conflict and the conquering thing on a large scale, as opposed to just a small scale. Um, I don't think that's a great idea either. But the idea of having a republic in order to contain conflict and to to, um, to um, avoid social disintegration is a very French idea. That's how the French and most Europeans actually see the idea of a republic. Uh, it's not utilitarian. It's just this is the best that you can hope for in the real world. And in a sense, that is kind of an ideal, isn't it? If you look at the way the French see the republic, they don't see that, that the republic produces anything wonderful, but they say under the circumstances, this is the best model to avoid becoming, I don't know, a Bosnia or a, um, a Syria or, uh, or even a Germany. Uh, throughout much of its history, where all that the, you've got is internal conflict and brutal, horrible internal conflict. So the French would say, our version doesn't stop conflict, but at least it contains it and allows it to flourish for the better good of the community. We keep shaking the mixture this way. Um, you know, it um, it won't decompose because we keep we keep shaking it with our republic. It's kind of a negative idealism, but it's an idealism no less all pervasive than the American version of its utilitarian based patriotism. Conflict is not bad. Um, even high stakes conflict. Arguably the conflict that, that the conflicts that I engage in are of higher stakes even than uh, a physical one, arguably. At least for some people. Because some people live and die by ideas. I attack all ideas. Um, what would you rather have? Would you rather be killed or would you rather be thrown into a lifelong state of chronic intractable anxiety? I think I'd rather be killed, to be perfectly honest, to live with anxiety day in, day out, never ending, in a constant state of existential panic. But that's at stake when, you, when you're clashing with ideas. Um, I think that's what people really hate about me, is that I'm attacking everything. Everything in the same way that kind of an antinatalist does, or at least a certain type of antinatalist, attacking all the um, most profound assumptions that people make to make sense out of anything. Attacking what the herd holds nearest and dearest. But we're disagreeing on the fundamental nature of the herd, but I would say that we're both agreeing that we're not that we're eccentrics. We are not concentric people. We are eccentrics. I'd say that almost everybody here that I'm arguing with uh, on YouTube or disputing with or clashing with or debating with or having a dialogue with are what you might call eccentrics. In other words, they're people that have thought themselves above about about what you know above what how most people believe things. Some people have thought have, have concluded that. What everybody else believes is rubbish, and I can't believe that anything anything beyond that is any good. Okay. Then I guess you're what I would call a life denier. Some of us also say, okay, you've disproven everything. Wow, we're free! You know, that's how I see it. I, I, I see it as not a loss of something when, when my blinkers are removed. I don't think that I'm going to be destroyed by becoming Zapfi's caveman or tossed out into the bright sunlight after being yanked without my foreknowledge out of Plato's cave. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's almost like, oh, what a weight has been taken off my shoulders. Whereas other people, I think, if you're too addicted to the forms of things and you're too ad addicted to the mythologies and everything, and I, I, and I shouldn't even use the term addicted, when you're too dependent upon them and they're taken from you, then you're in trouble. And that's what I do. Um, arguably, Gary, that's what you do as well. Um, you throw people into a, a state of... We throw people into a state of panic sometimes. Um, and by attacking their most basic uh, premises. Um, an act of violence, perhaps. Every bit as violent as killing somebody. Um, you ever seen somebody have their mythologies totally destroyed quickly and ruthlessly? Not a nice thing to see. Um, and it's 
in many ways, um, you allow yourself to be really nastily uh, characterized if you do that, like being an ENTP, which is something I'd never heard of, but B. Quimby seems to think that I am such a thing. Okay, well, if you want to put titles on people, that's that's for you to do. I, I don't I don't expect me to go along with it. I've argued. I don't believe in God, and I, I've argued till I'm blue in the face that I'm not an atheist. Okay. <laughs> um, so if you want to call me an ENTP, all right, that's what you call me, not what I believe that I am. Or if I am, maybe I am that. But how much of that is what the is part is the totality of what I am? You know. The, just because I'm an ENTP doesn't mean that I, I, I can't be a billion other things that are completely opposite of that. Human human beings thrive seemingly on contradiction and paradox and double-think and all that kind of thing. Cognitive dissonance. We're, just to be human, we have to see, seemingly have cognitive dissonance. <clears throat> what do we do about this? Well, again, you manage that. Um, ever read Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf, which is very prescient for gar guys our age, where you can't ignore your own contradictions anymore. You know, your 40s and your 50s are supposedly when your real self comes out. You can't run from yourself anymore. That's the age when, you know, allegedly the, the closet homosexual has to come out or he'll go crazy. Um, or the um, the guy who has worked in an office all of his life has his ex existential midlife crisis and just, I can't do this anymore, so I'm going to quit my job and, I don't know, become a dishwasher or something like this, because I can, I really ultimately, that frees my mind to the point where being, like, say, an investment consultant doesn't. Um, that, you know, our age is when you can't sort of hide from yourself anymore. And if you've ever read Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf, it's about how you manage that, how you manage that process. He was two people. He was a nice, respectful, traditional kind of guy, and on the other hand, he was a brutal iconoclast uh, who really liked to get into everybody else's faces and attack what they had to say. And on occasion, he couldn't even restrain himself from telling them right to their faces, basically, to go fuck themselves, even though it, that was totally out of character with his nice side. This drove him insane, or nearly killed him, almost caused him to commit suicide. But he learned how to deal with his own paradoxical nature. Now, it's a very, I think, very misunderstood book. Um, he believed it was. The author, Herman Hesse, who was often seen as this really airy-fairy, idealistic kind of kumbaya kind of guy. He is and he isn't, I think. Um, because what that was basically, what the, the novel was about, was the main character attempting to reconcile the contradictions in himself with each other. Um, it's the same thing about the con the external contradictions. How do you manage those? Like, and and I would say, do you really think that this is a resolvable conflict? Okay, it's a non-resolvable conflict, but it's a conflict that's fundamental. Now what? Keep going, and I think that more solutions will pre will present themselves. They always seem to. And as we as more solutions present themselves, more problems will present themselves. In that vein, the, I have stopped looking at myself in the camera and my image has become more and more faint. It's a good thing I wore this hat uh, or else I just wouldn't be much to see anymore. But uh, sorry, my webcam is uh, wonky. I really got to get another one. <laughs>